Can I just share with you that I just have a heart to worship God. That's all I want to do. Everything that we say and do in this building should be to honor and praise and glorify and worship a most holy God. Because that is what we do when we walk into the doors of his sanctuary. It is not these walls. It's not this sheetrock and these chandeliers and this platform. None of that makes this the sanctuary. You know what makes it the sanctuary is all of us. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us all those years ago. And yes, do we have uh, technological issues and all those types of things? Yes, they come along with it sometimes. But when we boil it all down, it's really all just to worship a most holy God, isn't it? And so I am thankful that... God has placed me where he has placed me, among the people that he's placed me to serve, and with the people that God has called me to worship him together with. And I pray that this message this morning would just cause us to desire to worship our God. And that has been the desire of my heart. That has been the desire of Israel's heart as we have gone through this book is God or Israel just wants God in their midst. That's what they want. They want God to be there. They want to worship God. Did they mess up a couple chapters ago? They did. Right? Their desire to worship God caused them to not be patient and caused them to disobey the first two commandments that God gave them as a part of the law, the covenant that he made with them. And so, therefore, God had to withdraw himself and he left the presence of the people and there was consequence to sin. There's consequence to our sin. Israel's sin was God was pulling himself out. But because of the work of a mediator, because of the work of the intercessor in Moses, God then relented of what he said he was going to do, and he was going to have mercy and grace. Why? Because this is what God presented himself to uh, in behalf, uh, or sorry, in, pre- in front of Moses. He said, the Lord passed through him in verse 6 of chapter 34, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and their children's children to the third and the fourth generation. That is who God introduced himself to Moses as and to his people, was a God that is merciful, a God that is gracious, a God that is slow to anger, a God that is abounding in steadfast love, a God that is faithful, a God that is keeping his steadfast love. He is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. That is what he addresses, that's who he addresses himself as to the Israelite people. To Moses, he said, though you have sinned, though you have done wrong, though you have made the biggest mistake thus far, I am still a God of mercy. I am a God of grace. I am a God who is slow to anger. I am a God who abounds in steadfast love. I am a God that is faithful and will continue to keep my covenant with you in the continuing generations. Church, that is the God that we get to worship this morning. That is the God that Israel is going to be given the opportunity to worship here in the next couple chapters when God enters in the construction of the tabernacle. And all of this, 
this introduction of God leads us up to our passage this morning. And after God declares his name to Moses, he then begins to renew this covenant made with his people, Israel. Remember, the covenant had already been made by the two parties back in Exodus 23. But it was broken by the people of Israel when they decided to do what God told them not to do. You remember when they ratified the covenant by saying, we will do all that God said to do. Well, they failed to keep that promise. And But as we will see this morning, God still desires to dwell with his people, and he still desires for his people to, const- or to uh, worship him. Those are the desires of God's heart. To be with his people and to have his people worship him. That's God's desires. And that is the purpose for this covenant is to dwell with his people and to subsequently have his people worship him. Now, I want to look at the main idea of our text this morning. This is going to be the thrust of our message. This is going to be where our application lands, and this is going to be what I believe the text argues to us this morning, and that is this, that the veil has been lifted for those that have turned to the Lord, allowing us to behold the glory of God and be transformed into the image of God. Let me say that again. The veil has been lifted for those that have turned to the Lord. And in doing so, it allows us to behold the glory of God and be transformed into the image of God. I want us to look at Exodus chapter 34 this morning. And I want us to read verses 10 through 35. This is God's word. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people, and I will do marvels. And such has been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are su- who you are shall see the work of the Lord. For is it an awesome thing that you will do that I will do to you? Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Excuse me, sorry. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim, for for you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited to eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters who whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for the month Abib you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine. All your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a land. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruit of wheat wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land. And when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God, and you shall not make a boil, or you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. 
So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from the Mount Sinai and the two, the two, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, and as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that, Mount, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. And whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he, was, what he has commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's open in prayer this morning. Father, I pray that you would be with our time together. In your word, God, that it would be the words of you that speak to the hearts of your people. God, use me as a vessel, cleansed of sin, rid me of self. Lord, that I might be able to impart truth through your word to your people. God, I pray you rid us of distractions. Help us to focus on the truths of your word, that it might benefit our lives, that we could further serve you and advance your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So our passage this morning speaks to this covenant made with Israel. Now, we have hit, touched on this a number of weeks back. Uh, when we talked about the covenant, the Mosaic covenant made between God and Israel. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, tells us the purpose for this covenant. God says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to a, me a kingdom of priests and a holy Nation. That was the purpose of this covenant. That was the purpose of the law was so that these people could be a display of the glory of God and proclaim his name to a Gentile people who would then know that he is Lord. And so our goal this morning is to look at the renewal of this covenant. And the result of this covenant is God showing his glory to Moses and the effect of that had on Moses is where we will spend our application time this morning. And so I want us to understand that this is the renewal of the covenant God made. So there is much language in this chapter and in this passage that uh, is going to mimic the language spoken of in Exodus chapter 23. And so if it sounds like we've already touched on this, it is because we have. Um, but this is the renewal of that covenant that was broken by God's people. And God is re Knowing this covenant, why? Because he is a God of grace, he is a God of mercy, steadfast love, and faithfulness to his people. And so we're going to look at this this morning. There's three sections in our passage that I believe are going to lead us to the culmination that is God revealing his glory to Moses. And so we'll spend half of our time looking through the text, pulling out things throughout the text, and then we will spend the rest of our remaining time together in our application um, to, uh, this morning. And so let's go ahead and look at the first few verses. Uh, and that is our first point, the covenant's renewal. And so this is kind of God's introductory statement, so to speak, uh, as a description of the covenant that he is renewing with his people. And so if you would look at verses 10 and 11 with me, he says, and he said, behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as what had not been created in all the earth or in any nation, in all the people among whom you shall see, or who among you who are among you shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so he is saying, This is what I will do. I will do marvels. I will do marvels in front of you. He tells them, I'm going to do marvels, and then he tells them what those marvels are going to be. And he says, I will drive out the enemy. 
Again, this is him restating what he'd already said to them in chapter 23, when he said, Then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Jebu Hivites and the Jebusites, I will blot them out. Again, this is God restating his purpose for this covenant. Remember, this is a two part covenant, which means there is a conditional, or there is a condition upon this, upon <coughs> Israel upholding their part. <coughs> Hence the need for renewal. And we know that because he says, Observe what I command you to this day. But if you carefully obey my voice, and do all that I say, he said in chapter 23. And so the covenant is this. If you obey all that I tell you to do, I will drive out the enemy and give you the land that I swore to your fathers. That is the covenant. That's the purpose of this covenant. And so he's just restating that in verses 10 and 11. And so he began by revisiting that description of the covenant in Exodus 23. Our next section is in verses 12 through 28, and that is the covenant's term. So God reintroduces the covenant made with Israel, and now he's going to describe some of the terms. <clears throat> now, if you remember, uh, in, chapter, or in, verse, or in chapters 19 through 22, God describes those, uh, those terms in detail. <clears throat> he is not going to, again, elaborate on every detail that he did in next Exodus 19 through 22, but he is going to hit a few points. <clears throat> He gives them a brief summary. In verse 12, he states, Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. Meaning, make a covenant with me, lest you fall and enter into a covenant with the enemy. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, look back on the history of Israel, the not-too-far-away history of Israel. What did Israel do? Israel brought with them the jewelry, the gold, and the, the, the things that God gave them from, ex, or from Egypt, and they held on to those things. And when it came time uh, for Moses to go up down, off, on the mountain, and he's up on the mountain, and he's receiving the word of the Lord, 40 days and 40 nights pass by, and the people want to worship God. And so what do they do? They fail to trust in God's promises, and they return to their idols the jewelry and the gold that they then fashioned into a golden calf representing the, the, God, the um, gods of Egypt. And they go back to their gods and they make a covenant with their false idols. That's what God says not to do here. He says, make this covenant with me, obey this word, lest you fall into temptation and you begin to make a covenant by falling into your idols of the past. And so he's, he's, telling, he's telling them that they ought not to make a covenant with, the, uh, with uh, the enemy. And in doing so, he tells them, you must tear down Asherim. What is Asherim? Asherim is a sacred tree or a wooden pole that the enemy, that the, these people would worship. And this thing represents the idols that God is telling them that they will fall prey to if they do not destroy them and continue to, make, to keep the covenant with their God. And so he makes the statement then to take of their daughters for your sons and take daughters or, and their daughters who whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. What does that mean? It means do not allow them to do so. Because if they do, they're going to warp their thinking and they're going to cause them to fall into sin. He does not want them to intermarry with the enemy. Because they will begin to bring in their, the idol worship into the family of God and it will destroy them. Well, we see as you get further into the Old Testament that that exactly was what happens when they intermarry with the enemy. And so this covenant is built off the first two covenants that God said. And those first two covenants are who they are to worship. One, have no other gods before me. And two, make no other graven image, right? But God doesn't stop there. He makes sure to offer instructions on how they are to worship. So he tells them, do not worship other gods. Do not make any other gods out of anything other than 
uh, who I am, right? And then he offers instructions on how they are to worship. And he tells them these things. There's four different things that he hits at in this passage. Obviously, he, do, he is not um, describing each individual law that he gave them in 19 through 22, but he is passing through the important ones. And he tells them these four things. He tells them to keep the feasts, right? Why are they there to, have, to keep the feasts? Well, they are to remember what it is that God has done for them in the Passover. So they are to keep the feast. Then he tells them to consecrate the firstborn. Remember, we talked about the consecration of the firstborn way back earlier in the book. They are to give the firstborn to God. They are then to present their first fruits to God. Right? And then they are to observe the Sabbath. They are to rest in what God has done for them. And so he offers these terms, uh, things that they've already been told, things that he's already introduced to them, but he reintroduces them as a part of this covenant renewal. And then Moses then completes the process by writing all these things down. Remember back in 23 when, he, when they ratified the covenant, Moses wrote it all down, right? This was a part of the covenant-making process. They would write down uh, the terms, as, and he did so on these stone tablets. And it says, in ver- uh, so, that, or so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He was with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And this is re- replicating the first time that he went up onto the mountain and he was there 40 days and 40 nights and the people had sinned. And so God is um, going to uh, have Moses uh, be up there for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, repli- replicating the first time. So what do these terms show us? They show us that it means uh, what it means to belong to God in the covenant. That mutual relationship in which God gives himself to us and we give ourselves to God in return. That's the covenant. Is God is going to give himself to them and they are going to give themselves to God. Because those are God's two desires, right? That he dwell with his people and that his people then in return worship him. So that's what this covenant is. I'm going to give myself to you, and you are going to give yourself to me in form of this worship. Okay? How do we give ourselves to God? This is how God tells them, this is how you give yourself to me, by following these laws. And God is now going to stay faithful to this covenant, And he's going to dwell with his people, and in return, his people are going to worship him. Those are the terms. So God revisits this covenant. He then revisits the terms of the covenant. In our last section here, in verses 29 to 35, we see the covenant's effect. So if you would look at 29 to 35 with me. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time in this last section and the application section, which has to do with this. So if you would read with me, 29. God's word says, When Moses went, came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, and he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know the skin of his face shone, or shone, did not know that the skin of his face shone, because he'd been talking with God. And Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin on his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them that all the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. And Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel when he... Uh, what he was what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Now, finally, we see the effect of the covenant between God and his people. And it doesn't make much sense until we see how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians, but before we do that, let's just go through this passage and see how it plays itself out. Finally, We get to this point. And after receiving the terms, Moses came down off the mountain, just as he did prior, 
Only this time he carries the two tablets with him in hand and he doesn't chuck them on the ground and break them in his anger as what was going on in Exodus 32. But he keeps them with him. And there's something different about him. Something very different than the first time he came down off the mountain. It says that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. And Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Moses had come down off the mountain, and his face was glowing. Why? Because he'd been with God. The light of God's gracious compassion and faithful love was shining from his face. Remember earlier in our passage last week, uh, Moses asked God if he would show him his glory. And what did God tell him? God told him, I will do as you ask, but I will not show you all of my glory lest you die, but I will pass over and I will declare myself to you. And he declares himself to Moses, telling him that he is the God of grace, he's the God of mercy, he's the God of compassion, and never failing, never ending, let steadfast love. God's gracious compassion and faithful love was what was shining from the face of Moses. It was representing God's holiness and God's glory to God's people. And the people saw that and the people were afraid. Why were they afraid? Because they knew in their inmost souls that they could not stand before him for whose presence Moses had come. Why? Because they cannot stand, sinful man cannot stand in the presence of a most holy God. And so when God's glory and God's holiness was shining from the face of Moses, the people were scared and they did not want to go near him. Why? Because sin cannot enter into the very presence of God. And so Moses, after speaking with them, and tells them not to be afraid, tells them what's going on. He then, to calm their fears, puts a veil over his face. What else do we know about a veil? Where else have we seen a veil before? In the tabernacle, right? And What does the veil do? It separates the sin of man from the holiness of God. And so this veil is going over the face of Moses, separating sinful man from from the presence of a holy God. And Moses takes it off when he's speaking with God, but then when he comes back in front of the people, he puts the veil back over his face. So, this is our story, and what does God want us to learn from it? And that's our application section, our so what section. How does this renewed covenant between God and his people, Israel, apply to the Christian today. Because that is what we are to do with God's word, right? We are to read God's word in its original context, and we are to then see how we can interpret it and then apply it to our life today. So how is it that the, what is the renewed covenant, and how does that affect the Christian today, and what does it mean to us? Well, the best way to find application in Scripture is to find the application in Scripture. Okay, so go ahead to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. And I believe that this application most clearly is shown up to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul's second letter to the Corinthians is. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. If you would read with me, God's word says this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written now with ink, but with the people of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything, 
as hearing from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed its glory. Indeed, in this case, what once has what uh, yeah, indeed in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of that glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are uh, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, maybe you listened to me read that this morning, and you are very, very confused. Okay, And the only thing that you understand is verse uh, 7 through 10. 11, where basically Moses just retells what we just read, okay? Well, I want us to begin with the background here in Paul's letter, okay? Much, many of us know that when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church had very, um, let's say, they had a lot of problems, okay, in the Corinthian church. Not this Corinthian church. We are perfect, okay? But uh, the Corinthian church in the Bible uh, was... Uh, uh, very, they had just, I'll just put it this way, they had lots of problems, okay? And so he begins this chapter by stating, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation, written on your hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the very living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the heart tablets of human hearts. So people within the Corinthian church were asking Paul for a letter of recommendation. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul came and he spoke to the Corinthian church. And uh, so... There were these people called the Judaizers. Some of you know who the Judaizers are, okay? Um, just Pharisees that were infiltrating the churches of those days. And so the Judaizers were coming in, and they were giving letters of recommendation to the people within the church saying, this is why I am approved to be of a teacher of the law, and this is, here, this, this shows that I, why I am who I am. And so... Because the Judaizers were doing that, and they swayed the Corinthian church, now Paul's writing his letter to the Corinthian church, and they say, well, Paul, if you're going to come, you need to send us a letter of recommendation. And Paul responds to them by saying, well, um, are, we going, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, like it's us that does anything? Or do we need, as some do, a letter of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and to be read by all. Paul's basically saying, I don't need a letter of recommendation because I don't need to prove my righteousness. The way that my righteousness is shown is written on my hearts because of the spirit of the living God. He says, such is the confidence that we have through Jesus Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be the ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. 
because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul is basically saying, I do not have confidence based off of the law. I have confidence based off my sufficiency in God given to me by the Spirit of God. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. What is he meaning? The law fails. The Spirit gives life. And then this is where Paul begins to speak of today's passage. And this is where the connection is going to come. He makes a distinction between the old covenant and the new. In verse 7 he says, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? He's making the claim that the ministry of the Old Covenant is a ministry of death. He is now representing a ministry of the New Covenant. But why is the ministry of the Old Covenant a ministry of death? Though there was something glorious about the law in its time, the Israelites could see this in Moses' face, which was shining so brightly that they could barely look at it. However, the law could not bring full and final salvation. And thus, whatever radiance it had was fading away. Its glory was true, but was only temporary. Why was it only temporary? Because of Jesus Christ. Because of God's ultimate purpose to send a mediator. He says in verse 11, For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will it, or that which is permanent have glory. What is permanent? Jesus Christ and his fulfillment on the cross, his blood that was shed, that atones for the sin of the people in permanence. How much glorious is the gospel, the new covenant of Jesus Christ than the law? How much more glorious is the new covenant that Paul has been sent to be a messenger of than the message of the Judaizers that came with a letter? Of recommendation. He then goes on to explain why it is more glorious in 12 through 18. He said, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would have to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Jesus Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a, a, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now the, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with veiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He says that if one continues to live in the law, the veil will re remain unlifted and there will be no fellowship with God. Only in Jesus Christ can the veil be lifted. How do we know that? Because it says, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The veil is lifted, and the Spirit is given, and now the individual can behold the glory of God and can become transformed into the image of his Creator. Paul is basically saying the gospel, Jesus Christ, is better than the law. So then what is our application this morning? Two things. The veil has been lifted, and we can now behold the glory of God. We are no longer spiritually blinded. Why? Because the veil has been lifted. Why? Because we have seen the need for a Savior. And as a result, the veil has been lifted, and we can now see the glory of God. Why? Because we are no longer bound to the law that cannot save continually. And permanently. But we are on to Jesus Christ. Who brings everlasting eternal redemption. 
our second point of application is this. We are continually being transformed into the image of God. Israel needed God in their midst to accomplish their purpose. We have been given the Spirit of God. Through the work of the Spirit, we are being transformed into the image of God. And as a result, we are able to fulfill our purpose. What is our purpose? And First Peter says, but you are a, what? a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may do what? Mo- proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Church, your purpose is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You cannot do that unless the veil has been lifted and the blindness has been lifted and you can behold the very glory of God, that then you can be transformed into the image of God. That is the only way that we can accomplish our purpose in life. And that is to behold the glory of God to the people of God. Notice Paul then says, are being changed. He says, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed. Not will be transformed or was transformed. It says, are being transformed. The grammar here is important because he's saying that this is a process. It's a process. Sanctification is a process. We are justified at the moment of salvation, meaning just as if I'd never sinned. We are forgiven, but sanctification is a process. And so he's saying that you are being changed continually. A believer of Jesus Christ is continually being changed. If you are not seeing change in your life as a result of the Spirit of God in your life, or if you have no desire to change and you'd rather be stagnant in your faith, You should do some serious searching to see if this is real in your life. Because as Paul says, the gospel changes lives. He didn't say it can change lives. He says it does change lives. It can change lives too. But it does change one's life. And so someone who says that they're saved and never result in change, never have a desire to change and move towards God, Maybe they ought to question their salvation. Check and see what I truly believe. Some of us are still living by the law in our lives. Some of us need to relearn the gospel. Some of us need to choose growth. Some of us need to be pushed like Paul pushed the Corinthian church. They need to be told that we're wrong. They need to be encouraged in their faith. It is not through following a set of rules that allows you to live out the purpose of God. It is through this new covenant, the grace of God, the finished work of Christ, And then the work of the Spirit that allows us the ability to accomplish the purpose of being the royal priesthood, revealing the glory of God to the nations. That's the only way that we can accomplish God's purpose. Is by the veil being lifted. And the Spirit of God working in the heart of the believer.